The healthcare landscape changing across the country, of course, is the debate over what do we do next with Obamacare? Um, do we fix it? Do we get rid of it totally? What do we do? Hey, if we had the answer, they would sure have the answer. Oh, of course. You know, I got to tell you, and we talked about this issue so much before Obamacare was passed. I cannot tell you how many times former Congressman Charles Bustani said on this very show, we are not going to have any primary care doctors. We're not going to have any primary care. They're all, it's going to be bad. Apparently, that may be where we're going. Dr. James Pickney joins us on the phone. And this shortage is a real thing, doctor. Oh, absolutely. You know, we uh, we might be down about 35,000 doctors in the next eight years and possibly up to 104,000 in the next 12 years. So this oh. is a huge problem that needs to be addressed. So, I mean, we do know the expense of, of becoming a doctor. We also know the constant, you know, from malpractice to with staffing to uh, you know other expenses that come with being a primary care physician. Does that all play into this? Well, I think, you know, when medical students and, and residents make their choice to choose primary care, all of those factors come into play. So the amount of debt that you have, uh, the amount of money that you're going to potentially make, uh, it's much higher in the specialties. So primary care isn't as glamorous as it once was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, we kind of have to work uh, 80 100 to 100 hours, uh, but yet we don't make the same type of yeah. salaries that your, your, surgeon, your surgeons are going to make. So it's a tough decision. Uh, it's great to have patient care, but government regulations and paperwork and trying to chase insurance dollars, it's really challenging out there for a lot of doctors. So I have a couple of personal friends who who started out in, in medical school kind of going in that direction. And, and once they saw all, like you said, the paperwork, everything that comes along with it, they realized they wanted to actually care for patients more than they wanted to deal with all of that other nonsense. So either they became a PA or a nurse practitioner or something where they're still doing a lot of the duties, but they're not an actual MD. Is that part of the trend too? Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, people don't want to deal with all the bureaucracy. You know, we spend 60 cents on the dollar trying to collect insurance claims and a lot of uh, independent practitioners, most of their staff is are tasked with calling uh, prior authorizations and calling insurance companies to collect dollars. And that's not where uh, the efficiency should be uh, determined. You know, we really want to get back to the patient physician relationship. And I think there's some models out there that are helping kind of curve this, this huge decrease, this huge shortage in doctors. Uh, one of them is direct primary care, where you actually cut out insurance, cut out the middleman and go with the direct relationship between the patient and the doctor. Also virtual visits are, are a huge part of, of my own practice here in Dallas uh, that make things more efficient. Hmm. I don't know. It's kind of like a whole new world to, to, to get yeah. people out of the insurance mindset. will will take a little bit, but we're going to have to do something because I would imagine we're not going in yeah, reverse. We've been in this kind of this trend forever. It seems like there's always some some kind of trend or something in healthcare, And unfortunately, it's not the best necessarily. We've got all these new we've got all these new technologies that we can use in healthcare and all these new things that we're working on yet, you know. Primary care physicians, that's a tough one. Doctor, I appreciate your time this morning. No, thanks for having me on. Coco News Time 541. The demand for primary care physicians in the U.S. continues to grow faster than the supply, and that's making it difficult to get in to see them. Dr. James Pinckney is the founder of Diamond Physicians in Dallas. Dr. James, why are people not going into primary care? You know, that's a multifactorial answer, LaDonna. It's, it's difficult to put a pinpoint on exactly why doctors aren't going to primary care, but a lot of medical students and residents have a lot of debt. Primary care doesn't pay what it used to. Uh, you have many surgical specialties that pay much more uh, for less hours of work. Uh, also, it's just not as glamorous as it used to be in the 50s and 60s. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork. We spend 60 cents on the dollar trying to collect insurance claims, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of regulation. Uh, it's tough out there for the primary care physician. So Quinnipiac University's Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine is trying to help. What is that school trying to do? Well, they're trying to incentivize med students to go into primary care. Uh, sometimes med schools will offer reduction in tuition. There's a lot of programs out there with the American Academy of Family Physicians with incentives. Uh, and, and what I'm trying to do uh, in Texas is actually reinvigorate the patient physician model uh, with membership medicine or direct primary care. Uh, there's some practices out there in San Diego as well that no longer take insurance and, and see patients uh, 
on a membership basis. So unlimited visits, no copay, unlimited urgent care, and, and now virtual medicine, telehealth is catching on as well. I love a product called Dr. Link uh, that connects uh, patients all over the country to one doctor. It's not a 1-800 number with a queue. You get the same doctor every time for one low monthly fee. So there are, there's innovation out there that will help with this physician shortage. You know, I've, I've done telemedicine twice. Is that an acceptable substitute, though, for seeing a doctor? You know, I still want people to have their annual physical and go in at least once a year. But for some people in rural populations or others who just can't get in to see a doctor, uh, telemedicine is a great uh, adjunct, but it's not a replacement for seeing a doctor. You're exactly right. All right. So what do you tell what would you tell somebody in medical school right now? What would your advice be to them? Well, I actually have uh, residents rotate with me uh, on the business side. Uh, I would say, you know, do whatever makes you happy, but primary care uh, is not dead. I think that there's great opportunity with this direct primary care membership medicine model. Uh, you get to spend more time with your patients. Your income goes up by 60%, and you have more quality time with your family. So I think there are outlets out there in primary care that can incentivize medical students to go into uh, family medicine, uh, and it's, it's really a rewarding career. You know, it's it's interesting because that's what that's what you guys do. You have a membership uh, practice as well at Diamond Physicians. It, is there any chance that under any kind of replacement for the uh, Affordable Care Act that that would become then okay instead of having to buy insurance, you could just actually buy care? Yes, I think the legislation is moving towards. Uh, having membership medicine, direct primary care being a, not a substitute, uh, but a replacement for these very expensive Cadillac plans. Of course, we want people to have some sort of backstop, some catastrophic insurance. But at the end of the day, if you can't afford both, if you can afford access to a doctor, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, we're going to be able to use HSA accounts here shortly for membership medicine. Uh, so Congress is moving slowly, but they do see the light at the end of the tunnel as membership medicine, direct primary care being a viable solution for our healthcare crisis. And what I, I just want to throw this out there: What do you think is the key, or is there a key to solving the healthcare issue here in this country? Because no politician can seem to get it right. Well, we have to stop focusing on access to health insurance and, and focus on access to health care because insurance does not equal, uh, or coverage does not equal care. So once we shift our thinking to actually boosting the amount of physicians in the country, increasing access, then we'll be on the right track. Dr. James Pinkney, thank you so much. He is the founder and CEO of Diamond Physicians in Dallas, Texas. WREC, but check out Dr. James with us right now. He's checking in with us again on Memphis Morning News. Always great to have you, Dr. James. Uh, out in the field, I guess sometimes it's a little bit harder than uh, in past days in, in being able to locate a good doctor, huh? Oh, it's very hard. Uh, there's a huge shortage out there right now. There's about 220,000 primary care doctors uh, in the country, and in the next 12 years, we might be short 100,000. That's almost 50% of how many doctors we have currently. Why is that? Are people just not interested in going through all the years and years and years and years of schooling to become a doctor? Are they afraid of the litigious nature of people these days? Why don't we have as many doctors? I think it's a combination of the fact that uh, not as many students are going into medicine as well as those that are coming out of medical school. Uh, primary care is just not attractive. You know, this, the surgical specialties, they pay more, they're more glamorous. You can pay your debt uh, back faster. So we have to reinvigorate uh, the doctor-patient relationship and make primary care fun again. And, and I think there's certain models out there that do that. One of the models are uh, the model that I practice in Dallas, and that is uh, membership medicine or direct primary care, where we cut out the insurance man uh, and go straight to that patient-physician relationship with a monthly membership fee. There's also some other technologies right now uh, that are fantastic uh, with virtual visits. I love a platform called DoctorLink. Uh, that actually allows physicians to communicate in a HIPAA-compliant, secure platform with their patients, and it's also a membership model. So it's no longer a fee-for-service. You pay one monthly doctor link fee, and you get unlimited calls and, and consultations in this virtual platform. Hey, doctor, and, 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 and just to touch on that for a minute, and I've heard Sean Hannity talk about this. I've, talk, I've heard Mark Levin talk about this. And without getting into any kind of plug or anything, I'd like to stay kind of neutral on this, but... I, 
I, I hear that there are there are there are several practices ac- across the country where, for one low fee, you can get your basic care essentially uh, with unlimited visits or X number of visits or virtual visits for your family. And, and then, are people on top of that with that affordable type of care? Then are they purchasing like some sort of catastrophic policy, which uh, they would only need in certain situations? How does something like that work on? A, on, on I, I I hear about this more and more on on our national talk shows. Sure. There's lots of ways to have that backstop. So um, with direct primary care, you have your membership model. You have your, your primary care doctor. It covers all of your acute visits, your urgent care. But if something catastrophic happens, you do need some sort of coverage. So some people will have a high deductible plan. Uh, others will go with an indemnity product. There's a great one called Affordable Choice out there that uh, is really popular. And then others will go with long-term acute care with cancer prevention policies, heart attack and stroke prevention policies. There's all kinds of ways to be creative with your, with your health care uh, uh, coverage that I think moving forward, uh, they're, they're going to gain more popularity. Well, this whole telemedicine thing from a I don't want to get other people's germ standpoint and have to go stand in the doctor's office, I can appreciate that. But what if I need a strep test for my kid? They can't really do that over a computer. How does that work? Yeah, that's, that's challenging with telemedicine. We can't actually put our hands on the, on the patient and uh, do an abdominal exam or do a strep test. But, however, in that example, we actually have evidence-based medicine called the center score where I can pretty much diagnose strep pretty accurately. Really? Yeah, virtual visit. If I can see the person's throat, I can look for those white spots, those exudates. You can take your own temperature, uh, and, and I can ask a couple questions. Do you have a cough? Are you under the age of 12? And that really gives me a, the ability to hone in on that diagnosis. So. A lot of medicine is algorithms, especially in primary care, and we can run through those algorithms on a virtual visit. Dr. James, do you think there, there will ever be a time where somebody could come in and swab their kid's mouth and maybe put it on like a dish or, or, or some sort of litmus paper and put it in a device, maybe at a kiosk, at, 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 <laughs> like at a Walgreens or one of your offices, and it be able to diagnose positive so or negative anymore. for you know, strep or something like that? Yeah, I, I don't doubt it. I feel like everything we see in the movies, uh, somehow comes to fruition. So uh, all the the Star Trek scanner where you uh, just kind of scan right. one and, and have a diagnosis, I will I would not uh, be surprised if in a few years we have something like that. And and which really I guess with the with the expected doctor shortages is really uh, the free market at work because there is going to be a need and somebody's come up with an idea to be able to skirt this anticipated shortage or at least hopefully stave it off for some now is this this telemedicine i guess this this, i mean this can go out to the farmlands this can pretty much go everywhere right i mean this is not there's no there's no boundaries there's no limit on geography you know that's what i love about uh about the doctor link is the fact that it increases the the physician's footprint so geographics are no longer a deterring factor Uh, i can touch patients all over the state of texas and, and there's the laws are loosening the legislation is being changed um i'm not sure what it is in uh, Tennessee, but um, in New Jersey and Minnesota, now the law has been changed where you don't have to see a patient in person to establish care. Hmm. Texas oh, okay. as well. All right, Dr. James, thank you for joining us on Memphis Morning News for an update on the, the doctor shortages and, and ways to uh, work around that. We appreciate it. Have a great day, sir. Um, I want to do this story because I wondered if you were having any trouble getting a uh, primary care physician. I've been blessed to have a uh, uh, a great primary care physician for many years, but uh, in some areas, they're having a hard time getting them, and there's a shortage. And uh, we have Dr. James on the line here today, and uh, Dr. James Pinckney II, and uh, says that Quinnipiac University is uh, trying to fix this shortage a little bit. And Dr. James, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Is that true that uh, Quinnip- Quinnipiac is uh, trying to steer people into primary care? Yeah, we're, we're, we're facing a huge doctor shortage. I mean, in the next eight years, we might see as many as 54,000 um, physicians uh, short in primary care. In the next 12 years, as much as 104,000. To put that in perspective, there's 220,000 primary care doctors in the country right now. So that's a huge number that we're going to have to overcome. And I love to see med schools trying to incentivize students to go into primary care. So this particular uh, medical university is offering um, bumping people to higher on the list, on the admission list, if they uh, commit to primary care uh, on, at the onset of their career. Got it. And the, uh, the reason that people don't go into primary care because people can't make as much money down the road, or is it in it's intensive care, a lot of details? What's the reason that people have steered away from primary care? 
Oh, well, I think it's multifactorial. So, yes, uh, in retrospect, when I look at the salaries for primary care physicians in this country, about 200000 uh, which is a great earning for you know, the vast, vast majority of Americans. But in the medical field, it's actually very low. It's at the bottom of the, of the pyramid scheme. Uh, your, your surgical specialists are going to make much, much more than that. So uh, that incentivizes medical students to go into a higher paying specialty so they can pay back their medical debt. Medical debt, medical school debt is tremendous, plus their college debt. Sometimes these students can have three, four hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. Uh, so it's critical that they pay that back in a timely fashion. So uh, also, uh, you know, primary care is not as glamorous as it used to be. You know, the primary care doctor used to be uh, the pillar uh, of the community back in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and now uh, we're kind of the, 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 we kind of are walked over. You know, there's lots of bureaucracy, uh, the seven minute visits with patients. It's just not the same. We spend 60 cents on every dollar trying to collect insurance claims. Primary care is not the same. However, there are models and there is hope for reinvigorating the patient physician model in primary care. Mm -hmm. For instance, what I do at Diamond Physicians in Dallas, it's membership medicine or direct primary care. So no insurance, direct relationship with your patient, unlimited visits, 24 hour access and unlimited urgent care. Our doctors also make about 60% more than the average family physician. There's also telehealth. Uh, there's lots of platforms out there that are creating virtual visits. The one that I uh, I've stumbled across that I love. It's called Dr. Link. Uh, you can go to the drlink.com. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows people in rural areas to access doctors as well as urban areas that can't get in to see a physician. The average wait time is about 48 days across the country to see a doctor. Wow, just to, to see a primary physician. I always know that it's hard to see specialists, but getting to that. Tell me more about uh, what you folks do. You said Diamond Link. You're the CEO of Diamond Link Physicians in Dallas. How, how do you charge? Oh, Diamond Physicians. Diamond Physicians. Diamond Physicians. Okay. How, and then Dr. Link is a totally separate platform. Okay. How, how, do you, uh, how do you charge patients? You said there's no insurance involved? Yeah. So we charge a monthly membership fee. Uh, typically, on average, it's uh, around $100. And that gets you complete access to your doctor, 24-hour access, unlimited visits, no copay, 24-hour access, as I mentioned, and unlimited urgent care. So you can come see your doctor on your terms. Uh, we could call, text, email, FaceTime. Uh, these are all great ways to uh, become more efficient in delivering care. And also, our, our average visit is 45 minutes to an hour instead of seven minutes. I can't do anything in seven minutes. I, uh, it, it, it's really a travesty that doctors on the insurance wheel have to go through in order to deliver care. Got it. Now, doctor, are you a primary physician? I am. I'm board certified in family medicine. We've got six doctors in our group now. You know, we would love to come to Ohio. I'm originally, you know, I was born in Dayton, Ohio. So I would love to bring this model uh, to Ohio. Uh, it's, it's needed. It's really hard for consumers to shoulder the increasing cost of health care. Insurance premiums are going through the roof. We have to figure out a way to lower the overall cost and increase access. And that's the biggest key. The government isn't focusing on access to health care because insurance coverage does not equal care. As I mentioned, with the 48-day wait time, a lot of doctors don't even accept many of the insurance um, products on the Affordable Care Act. So just because you have insurance doesn't mean that you can get in to see your doctor, and that is very sad. Got it. Now, doctor, with yours, it sounds like a concierge service where it would be more of a high-end medical um, clientele? Uh, no, and, and that's actually the misconception that we're fighting. Uh, there's direct primary care practices all over the country that charge as little as $10 per member per month. Uh, so there are doctors out there that have a variety of price points where patients all over the country can find the right fit for their income, uh, and it is possible to deliver great care uh, for $50, $60, $70 mm -hmm. a month. That DoctorLink product that I mentioned, um, it ranges between $50 and $75 per month for unlimited consultations. Yeah. Now, it's on a virtual platform, but still, for some people, that may be their only option. Got it. Doctor, real quick, just give me a minute on this. Um, should we go to a single-payer system and then have a system like yours where you can go above and beyond that? You know, I am not a proponent of the single-payer system. Uh, we kind of have that in the VA system. Uh, it's overloaded. It's, it's hard to navigate the, the customer service. The delivery of care is, is subpar. Uh, single payer is not the way to go. Okay. Uh, private medicine and letting f the free market dictate the, the models in the industry is the way to go. So we should keep our, our commercialized insurance system the way it is 
from a private perspective, but let the free market dictate supply and demand. And that will actually drive costs down. All right, Doc. Well, listen, it's good to have you back and uh, a Dayton gem, huh? Uh, you're not uh, too far from us and uh, a great city that Dayton is. I hope that you can bring the service to uh, Ohio at some point. So do I. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Doctor.